97 to 91 is your final score here in Walsh Gymnasium in South Orange, New Jersey. Two overtimes and two excellent teams as well. I'm John McCooch alongside Brian Henderson, my co-host here to discuss the post-game coverage of this event here from Walsh Gymnasium. Brian, what are your initial reactions to this phenomenal outing of basketball? I mean, it was amazing. Uh, double, a double overtime game is always going to be good, and especially the one we got. I didn't even know we were going to get that double overtime because of that half-court shot, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. But, I mean, it was absolutely, you're absolutely right. It was two great teams battling it out, and they were just phenomenal. I mean, both teams were hitting shots, not so much towards the end there, but, you know, just an amazing game. It's something I, I'm glad I, I witnessed, you know. And one of the reasons that you could say this game went to double overtime was the injury to Maya Jackson, number five, for Seton Hall. Ankle injury late in about the fourth quarter. How big of an impact did that have on the re resolution of this game? I mean, I think it had a very big impact. She's like, she is the spark plug of this um, uh, Seton Hall basketball team. You know, she, co she um, uh, comes off the bench, provides great shooting, provides great leadership, all that good stuff. And her going down at such a pivotal time in such a big game, it hurts. Uh, I'm sure the team felt it. You know, um, uh, Katie Armstrong and Benbury did a good job of filling in for her, but, you know, I feel like her presence was really missed. A very unfortunate injury for the Seton Hall Pirates, but here's what Coach Bazella had to say about it. No, no, I, I, I know that hurt us too, her spraining her ankle and us being short of guard as it was without Amari. Um, but, you know, that's what people have to step up. And, you know, I, I thought Maya and Katie so we stepped up. Um, I hope it should be back soon. The Creighton Blue Jays had a phenomenal outing from the three-point line. 43-point attempts for the team from Nebraska. They shot the ball every time that Seton Hall was able to get a bucket. Cray responded with a three-pointer of their own, Brian. And that was really the story of this game, of how well Creighton was able to shoot from the perimeter. I mean, yeah, you're, abs I mean, you're absolutely right. 43s in a game, is, you, have, you have to build your team around taking 43s, and that's what they have. I feel like almost everyone on that Creighton team can and will shoot threes, and they, they can all make them, too. But taking 40, they didn't hit as much as they did the last couple of games. I believe they only hit about 13. So, but that's still around 33% from three. So, I mean, this is what their this is what their team does. They 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 take a bunch of threes and they make a bunch of threes, and that's how they put up 97 points. Taking run and gun to a whole new level. Sydney Cooks in the fourth quarter again. A very tight contested game had a crucial block on a layup that was after a wide open missed layup from Creighton. Just Brian, talk to me about just how amazing and crazy that moment was to witness here in Walsh Gymnasium. Well, when we were up there in the crow's nest, once she caught that inbound pass and she was caught in the post, turned, and when she was driving to the rim, I saw a completely uncontested lane and I thought, wow, this is, this is how it's gonna end on just like a layup with a couple seconds left. When that missed and then they still got the rebound and then Cooks went up for the block, I mean, it just makes this game so much better. They had so many moments when you thought it was over and then one team came um, uh, clawing back. At the end of the first overtime here in Walsh Gymnasium, a moment unlike any moment that has ever occurred here in this historic building, Tatum Rembaugh at the buzzer, a half-court shot just off the fingertips. Just enough of a finger for that ball to not count after a long review and a very long review, I will add, in that moment. But, Brian, how electric was that moment here in Walsh Gymnasium because Tatum Rembaugh, only two points in the entire game, could have had five if that shot went in, but... Just enough of a finger, Brian. It was electric. Yeah, I mean, I don't think there was a single person in this entire gym that w when they saw that shot, they didn't think it went in. I thought it went in. You saw both. Well, you saw Creighton celebrating. Seton Hall looked completely dejected. And then the refs, the deliberation, the, the review of that play, easily, easily over five minutes. Just back and forth, back and forth. People didn't know what was going on. And you could see, if you looked at Creighton, at, of course, at the beginning, they were ecstatic. They thought they just won the game in a half-court shot. But as that, that clock continued to tick and as those refs continued to look at it, you could just feel kind of something was wrong. Something wasn't right. And, yeah, like you said, off the fingertips when the clock hit zero, so close. It would have, been, it may, it would have made this game, that would have been the perfect ending, in my opinion. Tatum Rambau just a fingertip away from making the most legendary shot, potentially in the history, of Creighton women's basketball here. But the second overtime was all Creighton. The Blue Jays ended up winning the game 97-91. to As previously mentioned, Andre Espinosa-Hunter did indeed foul out after putting up 35 points of basketball. Lauren Park Lane, the queen of the fourth quarter, the queen of overtime, 24 points and 12 assists. But again, that second overtime, the Pirates were clearly winded. They were tired, as everybody here was, especially the Seton Hall Pirates, as they put forth a great effort 
in that loss. But Brian just ran out of gas, it seemed, for the Seton Hall Pirates. Yeah, they absolutely ran out of gas. And double overtime tends to do that. It really tends to do that when you only have about seven or eight players available. I don't think a single player got subbed out from the, um, from the Pirates, maybe in all of overtime, but especially not in double overtime. Uh, Armstrong, she played well, but she had running on fumes. Park Lane played all 50 minutes. Espinosa Hunter also would have played all 50 minutes had she not fouled out with, 40, with, with 49 minutes. I mean, still, they never came off the court. They were just tired. They were gassed. It's, it's plain and simple. It's a shame that that's how it has to end. They just ran out of steam, but, you know, that's the way it goes. That is indeed the way it goes. And for Creighton, again, their offense was elite. They are averaging 100 points in their last three games, exactly 300 points in their last three games, and 97 here against Seton Hall. How was their offense able to create just so much energy and so much momentum for this Blue Jays team? Obviously, you have the three-pointers, but mm -hmm. that ball movement was something else for the Blue Jays. Yeah, for me, it's mainly two things. One, they live and die by the three. They take a lot of threes. They took 40 in this game. They don't stop shooting. They don't get deterred even when they miss. Like We saw them miss a handful of threes today. And number two is they're such a deep team. They have so many people who can shoot the ball and who will shoot the ball. And that's, I think, the big key. That's, what, that's how they can put up 100 points over the um, uh, like a ma like average about 100 points over these three games is if someone's not shooting well, someone else is, and they can cover the slack. Something we discussed in pregame, you said especially that Seton Hall can only hope to contain this Creighton Blue Jays team, but the Seton Hall Pirates did their best to match them. Ten three-pointers of their own, 13 for the Creighton Blue Jays. But looking ahead to Tuesday's game at 2 o'clock here again in Walsh Gymnasium against the Butler Bulldogs, a team that only has one win on the season, a team that many would say that the Seton Hall Pirates would have an easy time defeating, but after a very long overtime, they will be winded only a day of rest, really, when you look at the schedule. Will that be an issue? How will the Pirates struggle, or how will they respond? Um, personally, I don't think it's going to be much of an issue. Like you said, this team has one win and 22 losses. I don't think they're sweating over playing Butler, in my opinion. But yeah, uh, Park Lane and Espinosa Hunter and the entire team, they're going to need a good night's rest for this game. And hopefully they can take the, um, uh, take the loss tonight and just you know go full force against Butler. Don't hold back. They will definitely need that long night's rest. Don't stay up too late about the loss of this game, although it will be a struggle to come to terms with what just happened here in Walsh Gymnasium here for the Seton Hall Pirates. But that will do it here for Pirate TV and our sports coverage here from Walsh Gymnasium yet again. I'm John McCooch alongside Brian Henderson. The Seton Hall Pirates fall to the Creighton Blue Jays 97-91. to 91. Thank you for watching. We will see you around.